Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a grand solar minimum update Tuesday, June 28th, around 1 p.m. Mountain Time 2022. The models are in, and there's heavy rain, heavy monsoonal activity continuing in the Four Corners region, which means more flooding as the sun goes quiet. But the big story, large hail, damaging winds possible with multiple rounds of storms Tuesday in the upper Midwest. Keep calm. It's boom time. Wisconsin will be the big winner. Chicken dinner. Here's the future forecast in just a few hours from now. And we're talking Eau Claire East, a line of severe weather. So heads up if you're in that region. As the monsoon storms leave Flagstaff communities cleaning up from a mess. And that it's means hitting all flash around the state. Floods. Take a look at this rain coming down. So. Everyone in that region is well aware of the monsoon, and that's good news. Now, EF2 tornado tears a 30-mile path from Cotton Pickerel Lakes to Monaga. <laughs> the, st the tornado was likely wrapped in damaging downburst winds for portions of its path, which included Little Toad Lake, Toad Lake, Wolf Lake, ending around two miles southeast of Monaga, according to the National Weather Service. Now, this is in the Detroit Lakes region. Cleanup and power restoration continued as the EF2 tornado tore a path from the Cotton Pickerel Lake all the way to Menanga on Friday evening. This tornado was 30, path was 31 miles long, according to Grand Forks and the National Weather Service. So lots of damage is associated with that. So just a heads up there. As West Texas farmers and ranchers fear the worst as drought and heat near 2011 records. Well, that was exactly the same time during last solar cycle. I wonder if it's a cycle. Oh, nothing to see here. In fact, there is something to see here, and we can just get to the model. And there's West Texas that's going to be getting some precipitation. The entire state of Texas, including East Texas. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But Tropical Storm Bonnie forecasters are... Tropical Storm Bonnie question mark? <laughs> It's not named yet, but forecasters are tracking three Atlantic systems, inclu uh, including one in the Gulf. And we have those pulled up for you. Oh, dear. Where are we? There they are. Boom, boom, and boom. So disturbance number one is going to slowly move to the west here and then up into Texas. And number two is probably going to hit Nicaragua, like we said, seven days ago. There's probably nothing happening with the third disturbance. But the first one, Invest 95 model tracks, and that is the movement uh, either it's going to hit anywhere in Texas here, but the best track would be here to move into West Texas to bring that area much needed moisture. Probably hit right in the center of the state here on the Gulf Coast. So heads up, you're going to be looking at just a little bit increased rain, about four inches of rain over the next few days. Now, the big storm that's going to turn into a hurricane in this region and slam into Nicaragua, all the models are coming together that it will be a central, southern central Nicaragua impact. Move across the Central Americas, and maybe strengthen here in the Pacific. So we'll keep a close eye on that for you. But the key message for potential Tropical Cyclone 2 or Hurricane Bonnie, when it becomes Hurricane Bonnie here before it hits Nicaragua, heavy rainfall expected across the Windward Islands and northeastern Venezuela through Wednesday. Localized flash flooding will be possible. Winds to Tropical Storm Force are expected over portions of the southern Windward Islands tonight, over Isla Margarita Wednesday morning, and over the ABC Islands by Wednesday evening. There's higher than normal uncertainty certainty in the system forecast intensity once it reaches the southwestern Caribbean late Thursday and Friday, where, in our opinion, it will intensify into Hurricane Bonnie. Now, there is a threat, threat for severe thunderstorms into portions of Wisconsin, as we opened up the podcast with, and Montana as well. Threat for severe thunderstorms across parts of Montana and the upper Midwest as a frontal boundary moves across the region, locally heavy rain possible. It's going to be uh, at its max between, let's say, 2.30 and 5 p.m., so heads up for those times. We also could see possible heavy rain in the southeast, Gulf Coast, and southwest over the next few days along a stalled boundary. We've gotten another half inch here. We're now up to two and a half inches in just the last week. We are absolutely saturated here. There's also some fire weather concerns uh, in the central plains, and that will build once again for most of the plains and spread eastward during the week. What a tweak. The precipitation looks good for the entire country, except for this dry avenue here. And we're talking southwest Idaho, almost all of Nevada, and southern California. 
Take a look at that. It's just dry for the next two weeks. Maybe a little something happening there mid-July. Cross your fingers. Now, four ways to understand why Australia is so cold right now, despite global warming. Well, it's not warm there. Antarctica is, in fact, 5.1 C below the 1979 to 2000 base. I mean, that's a 40-year average, and it's five degrees below that, according to the Climate Change Institute. And so in the Southern Hemisphere, when the Antarctic is that cold, the rest of the region is going to be cold as well because it's winter, well below average, which is why it has nothing to do with global warming because it's a fantasy. Seismic update. No quakes of note. All is quiet across the country. Interesting. 2.5 in Missouri. Some uh, new Madrid activity there, but nothing significant to worry about. Worldwide volcano news update. No spectacular eruptions over the last 24 to 48 hours. We've got normal activity from Fuego, Sangue, Reventador, Sakurajima, Nevados de Ruiz, and Sabancaya. So nothing spectacular there. But what we do have is uh, lots of seismicity happening over in Iceland. We just did a special update on Ashja Volcano, giving you a little bit of historical context about the 1875 eruption and how that affected the country and the world. But we have now an earthquake swarm at the Tyrannus Fracture Zone, in fact. This is off the northern tip of Iceland at the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And let's look at the seismic map there. So that's in this region, the Tyrannus Fracture Zone, where uh, that star is. We also have activity at Ostia. We have activity at Bartabunga. We have activity on the Reykjanes Peninsula. We have activity along this ancient volcano that hasn't erupted in quite some time. This little flurry here is the activity up in the Tyrannus Fracture Zone. We'll go check that out real quick here. There it is. There's that cluster. There it is. So lots going on on Iceland. And as soon as something pops... We'll let you know. Space weather news update. All is quiet on the sun as activity approaches KP0, which is going to stay pretty quiet for a long time, which means you and I, well, you know what I'm thinking. We'll be psychic. Now, there's a good reason why the sun is quiet. If you come take a look at this graphic here from solon.info, you're looking at solar and geomagnetic activity over the last year, and what you're going to see quite uniquely is about 12 spikes in activity corresponding to months. So every month we have a spike in solar activity where we have geomagnetic storms or things firing off the sun here, including coronal hole streams, and they are very regular, especially over the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. It's very predictable. So we can easily say that for the next week or two, the sun is going to be completely quiet. That's going to ramp back up, and there will be a peak on July 20th, from let's say July 15th to the 18th to July 30th, we're going to see some big booms from the sun. And we'll bring you back at that time in a month from now to prove our point. Mission to Mercury, ESA's Bepi Colombo probe makes second flyby, capturing unique geological features. We call them craters. Secret ancient Andean passageways may have been used in rituals involving psychedelics. Hidden passageways used by ancient Andean culture are opened up for the first time in 3,000 years. And these archaeologists have revealed a complex of hidden passageways and galleries deep inside the ancient Chavin de Huantar temple complex in the Peruvian Andes. The researchers think the network of chambers and galleries was used in religious rituals possibly involving psychedelic drugs. Now, this is the first time in 3,000 years that these particular hidden structures have been explored, and some of the dark and isolated chambers may have been used for sensory deprivation, while some of the larger galleries seem to have been used for the worship of idols, said John Rick, a Stanford University archaeologist who's leading the research. And here is some of the vessels that were recently recovered with still material inside them from 3,000 years ago. This one has liquid. And so archae as an archaeologist, you don't want to dump that out when you find it. You want to see what's still in there. And it's interesting. There's like a head on a head there. Hmm. Fantastic. Now, a new study solves the long-standing mystery of what may have triggered the Ice Age. Now, it's going to take a while to get through this one. So we'll do an update on magnetic reversal news tonight on the topic. 
Now, this new study led by University of Arizona researchers may have solved two mysteries that have long puzzled paleoclimate experts. Where did the ice sheets that rang in the last ice age more than 100,000 years ago come from? And how could they grow so quickly? Well, I can tell you it has a lot to do with overturning circulation in the ocean. But for more, join us later tonight for a full update. Now, take a look at this. This is where all the rich people are going to hide during the apocalypse. Well, just a few of them will be up in space. But this massive plane would have the ability to remain in constant flight, powered by 20 nuclear engines. And the visionary aircraft would feature a glass-domed entertainment deck with 360-degree views of the sky. It would be living above Mount Everest. It would be insane. A nuclear-powered sky hotel for the elites. Holy macaroni. We can't even blow this up. Give me a second. Introducing. Now I'm going to turn the audio off because it'll probably be copyright and demonetized. But Sky Cruise is powered by 20 nuclear power plants. It has enough space for maybe thousands of people to live comfortably, including open air decks. You could live in this. Uh, it would be perpetually flying forever and would provide all its own food. So they'd be growing food in here. Plus they'd have storage capabilities and there would be other aircraft coming up and providing supplies for this. There's an elevator to a huge observation deck up there you're looking at with the main entertainment deck. Take a look at that. This is just, this is like Bill Gates' yacht on steroids, basically. Everything you need in one place, and you never have to be on the surface. Does this sound a little dystopian to you? Well, I couldn't agree more. Hope you got something out of the video. And that's a boom to knowledge. Creepy things happening with the elites these days. That's why you tune in. So you can be properly prepared for what's eventually about to happen. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. And be safe. We love you.